Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hardfire Media Liberal Conversations on Brooklyn Free Speech Media. My name is Cameron Weber. I'll be your host. I'm a, a political economist and historian. This is our second part on big media and censorship. Um, we've recently uh, we've got Australian guests who uh, have recently negotiated in Australia something called the news media bargaining code. So in other words, the social media has been historically in the last 15 years since Facebook that and at Google, Amazon, the, the, the point is, is that historically the business model was that, let's just talk about Google and Facebook because they're the main characters in the Australia, Australian play and also in the United States regulation, mm -hmm. is that in order to attract people to use their website, mainstream media, corporate media, what we're talking about, say the Murdoch, uh, the, the, the Google and Amazon would use algorithms that the user of their uh, social media would then get links to establishment corporate journalism, which they could click on or not. And what prevented Google and Facebook from negotiating fees for content prior to this news media bargaining code? What prevented negotiations between Facebook and Murdoch? Why, why did you need a code to allow this and uh, trigger this uh, bargaining between creators of content and those that put it on their algorithm? Why did we need a law to do that? What prevented it from happening before? Does anybody know? Well, I, mean, I didn't want to pay the money. Oh. I mean, ha has it changed now? I mean, couldn't couldn't uh, the mainstream media have put up firewalls? Why why the force negotiation? Couldn't I thought the idea was you you channel the the uh, people using the browser to the to the to the channel to the to the news site and then they could charge if they wanted to or make it free if they wanted to I, I guess my question is why why do you need this intermediary can't can't the uh provider of content just create a firewall in the first place there are firewalls in uh on, on certain websites all of the major corporations do have those i think the analogy we kind of need to make here uh is that you can relate it to, to music. It, it, in a way, it's intellectual property. If somebody writes a song and it becomes a hit and somebody wants to use that music in their advertising campaign, then they have to pay royalties to the person who wrote the song. And intellectual property comes with... A lot, of the, a lot of effort goes into writing these stories. There's a lot of research and a lot of work is done. And so why should the person or the corporation who has supported that get nothing for it when somebody else just comes in, picks it up, holus bolus, pops it on their website and wants to make a buck out of it through advertising. So if you want to take somebody's song and use it in your advertising campaign, you have to pay a royalty. And it should be exactly the same for people who have done in-depth reporting and put their heart and soul into writing these stories. Yeah. You should pay for it if you want to use it. And why wasn't that negotiated prior to a law? Why, why did you need... Uh, large corporation going to the state asking for this this code why couldn't they have just negotiated it prior to at going to the state because facebook just said no we're not playing that game i think it came down to uh, a battle of wills and a battle of who thought they were bigger facebook and the precedent that would would be set globally as well um it got very nasty here uh, with Google threatening to withdraw from Australia and the government saying, well, that doesn't matter. Microsoft have got a, a search engine. Everyone should use that. So it, it almost uh, got to the ridiculous stage through. Well, that was, uh, that was, was the Senate inquiry or something, I think, Glenn, where they made those threats and the government uh, yeah. weren't very happy about that. But in the end, Cameron, and what that is, in the end, rather than... The, the, uh, Google, Google and Facebook conceded in the end to having this bargaining code yeah, right. as opposed to having laws and regulations that regulated and controlled them. So in the end, when they uh, obviously realised that uh, something needed to be changed, mm -hmm. um, 
the, the bargaining code was far better than uh, fixed laws and regulations that yeah. they would have to adhere to and report to and be accountable for. Yeah, that, able- that's my take. That's my take, Len, but you're, you're much closer to these subjects than I am. So- oh, well, it, 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 it's exactly like that because as we saw when Facebook had a dummy spit and shut down a lot of... Uh, uh, a, lo- a lot of things on their page in Australia. Uh, yes. Some of the things that shut down were actually very important um, uh, for social well-being, uh, charities, and things like that. They just they just went bam, and it's like a, a knife through a hot knife through butter. They just cut a whole heap of things, and I think the uh, the, the, the backlash against Facebook made them actually turn around and realise that it was in their interest to go to the bargaining code because, as you said, Greg, if it came down to the government making law against these tech companies, um, as you said, uh, Britain, France, Germany, a lot of countries overseas were keeping a very close eye on this and it could have been globally hugely damaging for Facebook and Google. So I think they thought the lesser of the two evils was the bargaining code. Let's go that way because maybe we don't want to take on um, governments after all. Yeah, what got what got us started on this uh, <laughs> the censorship. Uh, so here's the New York Post, which is a Murdoch paper, and you'll see that on the front page, there's they're calling for a boycott of, of Facebook. Right, Facebook, if you're not going to give us money for a, a content, then we're we're going to support a, a worldwide censorship of your of your platform, and so uh, right. So that there's Murdoch's and then also in the New York Post in the opinion page, they had a comment that says the United States should copy Australia's law. See, I'm, I'm a little confused. Like when I see articles on Facebook with for certain newspapers, you'll get just a description and a title. And then when you try to read it, it will tell you you have maybe one or two free articles. And then beyond that, you, the user, have to pay a subscription if you want to read any more. Yeah. Why like, couldn't it have been done handled that way? That's working more as lead generation in that case. Wait, say it again, Greg. That's working more as uh, lead, lead generation in that case, isn't it? It's taking you through to that um, that news provider and saying, here's two or three articles, but if, if you really like it, um, why don't you subscribe? So there are some con- controls. There. But I see the, the argument here would be like, you know, Murdoch is would be the main beneficiary of this, these agreements because he, he, gener- he starts a revenue stream he didn't have before. So naturally, he's going to be all for it as he was there on the um, cover of the New York Post. But Cameron, as a, a libertarian, yeah, are you better off or worse off as a result of this? Do you think? Are you happy about it or are you unhappy well, about it? My 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 take is um, goes back to what Derek asked at the end of the last show, which is people do have to discriminate because it's impossible to know everything. We're not omniscient. We're we're not. Uh, so we have to pick and choose what we what we consume, what we digest, and so. Uh, I said all that. Who, yeah, something like that. Who filters that information? Does that information get filtered by the individual through market competition or does it get filtered through the state? And so we, we all know about Orwell and his ministry of truth. So, right, the point about the Australian case, they said, okay, we're going to get antitrust exemptions in order to, to, to bargain together. So they're getting an ex- exception to the antitrust law to get the power to enforce the, uh, Google and, and uh, Facebook to pay for content when we've all decided, well, that could have been done voluntarily already through the uh, firewall. So I'm always suspicious. Whenever you see a, a very large corporation calling for a regulation, in, and I'm talking about the United States now, well, it's usually to entrench entrench their their, their position as a market leader. I mean, so here's, here's Facebook calling for... Uh, comprehensive internet regulations last time <laughs> and right and and here here's a, a you know a full page ad in, in the economist every every week and then 
full page ads in the New York Times. I mean, I think this thing cost $45,000, right? Last time, fax it to me. So whenever you see <laughs> Facebook agitating for rules and regulations that, that they would be writing, I would be a little bit wary. Something's gotta be going on. So, right, that, that's my comment. So who, who decides? Um, uh, so if, if is, so I guess my question, let me ask this, is there a problem which requires a state course of solution? In other words, do we have a problem with censorship? Do we require state intervention? That's my question right now. I would be suspicious if, if the whole problem is, is the markets only have media that leans one way. I'd be suspicious of using of the state taking the role of trying to create political diversity in the media. I don't know who else would do it, but I would be suspicious of the state taking that role. Right, in the United States, we have the left who wants to uh, censor anything going against the CDC. And then you have the right who uh, wants to uh, regulate the internet because they feel the right believes that right wing views are being suppressed by, by Google and Facebook. So both the left and the right want to create the state as determining what is the truth. Well, what about, if I may uh, say something about this, because I do have an opinion, uh, even though I'm not an expert on the media, uh, my take, and I was talking about this issue with a friend from Germany. So he's telling me, you know, looking at the things from Euro, from now from the European lenses, he's saying, look, in the US, you have a, a very big problem with the media, right? The media is just like after the money and we have all these like monetary interests and they are just presenting like uh, as what was mentioned by Glenn and some of, uh, of the speakers, uh, they're just presenting one side of the story, right? And I mean, to tell you, to tell you the truth, I'm not watching the, media, the US media at all, right? CNN, MSNBC, that's just like, garbage. I can just watch Democracy Now! 12 minutes in the internet for free and right. I'll get every the news that I need for that day, right? I cannot figure that out. Or Deutsche Welle from Germany or, you know, I don't want to say uh, another uh, censor. <laughs> uh, she maybe, you know, YouTube might, might kick us out. But my friend from Germany was saying, well, what we have here in Germany is a different model. People pay like a certain fee, a certain taxes, and they have like kind of like a collective type of enterprise and uh, their news media is in, in a way it's not like so much that the state is controlling it but they have a media that is controlled you know kind of like collectively in a community well look, the Germany's got community. that crazy uh i mean talk about speech code you know they uh you can't they have a uh, holocaust denial uh you well can't, we're gonna talk about that would be another different topic what i'm saying here is that they are trying to give the news as what, what Glenn is saying, you know, in an, I guess like in an impartial kind of way, letting people inform, you know, get their opinion, like form their opinions, but present all, their, all, all other sides, right? That's I think what we're ultimately aiming for. If you are looking at it, whether or not, you know, it's gonna be uh, regulated by the state or controlled by the market forces. Because I mean, if you ask me, what has led us to this position is that the companies can do anything that they want because of, you know, there is no regulation uh, of any kind, right? And that's just my two cents. <laughs> well, what, what kind of, what kind of regulate? Okay, leading on to, to regu about two or three years ago in the Economist magazine, there was, there was, it was a cover, the, pic, the cover was a toilet and it said big media, at the, at the time you would call it social media. So, so social media, we're calling it big media because we're look, talking about establishment print papers as well, but, it says big uh, social media's biggest concern being regulated like the sewer company. So my, the next question is, uh, should big media be regulated like public utilities? The end result of statist thinking to be regulated like public utilities. Uh, right, is big media like cable and internet providers, water and sewage, electricity and gas, where it is seen that it might be needed to be regulated by a benevolent state to ensure equal access and stability for everyone? To this end, why shouldn't Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google all be taken over and nationalized by the state? 
but, but I think the problem is that you're saying that the state is going to, I mean, the state has been captured by the interest of media, right, of the companies. So we cannot really like put our hopes in the state or the market, but try to do something collectively, right? Like maybe, I mean, that's my, my, my opinion. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but. Yeah, so the, the idea behind uh, the regulation of public utilities, right? So everyone's allowed access to it. It gets subsidized, but then there's no creative destruction. It gets just caught in this particular point. So you wouldn't have the incentive. You're, you're guaranteed a certain return on equity and that's all there is or a return on investment. So there's no incentive to do anything encouraging. Uh, uh, new technical advancements because you're locked into this entrenched position with a guaranteed return on equity. So I, I'm just a little bit concerned about uh, where, where any intervention in the United States might, might lead and creating a ministry of truth where those who have political power then control the media. Well, we know how well that works in, uh, in a lot of examples around the world, don't we? Um, China, uh, Myanmar, Former Korea. Soviet Union? Yeah. Uh, here's, here's something from the, the Economist magazine about, called Hammer and Sickled about Vietnam. So what they're talking about, in contrast to the authoritarian public sphere offline, notes Mr. Nugent, you have relatively liberal and free social media platforms where, where you can speak out your views. Vietnam, Vietnamese have been doing so about everything from corruption to pollution. The party, the one party system, is trying to change that. Over the past five years, it has arrested 280 people for anti-state activities up from just 68 over the previous years. It has instructed the state-run press to scrub the phases, the phrases civil society and human rights from its, from its pages. And in October, the government secured a promise from Facebook to comply with 90% of its requests to remove malicious posts. So Google has acquiesced to being content regulated by the government of Vietnam, which is a one party system. So in that case, we could call that censorship, right? Mm. Absolutely, that's censorship, 100%. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, Cam, can I just say, I think one of the things that has been lost as this, uh, th this, this movement of combining all media in the one basket, um, the gray area that I see here is that you have actually two forms of media. You have a news media, which has always based itself and its reputation and its credibility on its ability to be able to present the news in an, uh, as, uh, in an impartial way. And you have social media, which has allowed people to be able to let off steam and say whatever they want, whenever they want, without any repercussions. If, if in the news media, if we were to say some of the things that have been said on social media, we would be castigated and kicked from pillar to post and it would cost <laughs> all of the writers millions and millions of dollars. Yet social media, which is the other side of the media spectrum, gets away with everything absolutely scot-free, which then allows uh, like a monopoly like Vietnam uh, to be able to come in and do what they've done. You know, because or, indivi or individuals, Glenn, to come in and say whatever they feel like um, without any repercussions, really. Oh, absolutely. They, can, they get away with things. Well, I'm, I'm not actually on any form of social media, but being as part of the news media, I certainly, certainly see what's happening on social media. And a lot of the things that happen on that, it's just atrocious. You just can't. You wouldn't say that to the person walking down the street. You wouldn't say it mm. to their face, but you can say it on social media. We can't say it in the mainstream media. So there's that imbalance, and I think that imbalance has turned into a very grey area where the world seems to be lumping both sides into the one basket, and it's not like that at all. I think initially when social media came around, people understood the difference, and now... The younger generation who grew up with social media, I think, has a hard time distinguishing the two. Right. 
Mm. Oh, exactly. Depersonalized and personalized relationships, right? Glenn, you were talking about uh, journalism as being a craft that you de dedicate your life and work towards, where uh, social media is just a, a means for blowing off steam. But it's interesting to know that many of the young people don't use Facebook, for instance. So I don't think Facebook, you ask any teenager, they don't use Facebook. I mean, is anybody in this room actually on Facebook? I am not. <laughs> Derek is. I use Facebook. I use Facebook every day. But I mean, a lot of some people I mean, actually don't, Facebook, don't use it. Facebook and, and Instagram, and these are these are not just, I mean, they're for blowing off steam initially, but now they're like their brands, their their businesses, their self-marketing tools. And for some people, um, spreading their opinions on current events is their brand. That's that's how they get likes. That's how they get traffic. That's how they make a profit in some cases. So whatever mm. they're saying, even if it isn't necessarily true, but it is people like it and enjoy it, that gets views and that's profitable for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or it's a, or it's an opportunity for them to um, find an audience to express their opinions, thoughts, or whatever their agenda is that they yeah. didn't have before when they were, we only had the formal media prior to social media. So. Well, and um, of course, but then, but then you've changed in the last year because we're locked down, and so people are, are using social media more and more, and locked down. And of course, then the frustration gets greater and greater on the social media. Yeah, and then people who have uh, who have got an agenda and that they probably couldn't air through formal channels have uh, discovered that social media is a you know a tool that they can use to their advantage. And I think that there's, you know there's there's an issue there as well. It's right. not just for profit. It's to um, express extreme views that um, you wouldn't be able to express through normal channels. I mean, who, who would have thought that a job title called influencer would now be a career path? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we just have a, a couple minutes left. So let me ask the question again, and we'll go around. Is there a problem that the state needs to intervene in the Australia version you said, yes, there is, but the United States, we have the first amendment. Wouldn't any intervention deny and then turning over the determinants of truth to a ministry of truth appointed by, by, by politicians, wouldn't that destroy free speech? That's a very, it's a very leading um, framing, but I would say yes. The, the state controlling speech would then lead to censorship. I would agree. I would agree with with, with with the way you framed that. Yes. How about you, Francisco? Um, well, I think that my my perspective would be that. I mean, I understand the issue of uh, freedom of speech in the U.S. Having lived here for for some time, uh, but I do think that the state has to do some kind of like a job, not 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 to censorship. And I think this is important. What Glenn was saying that make a distinction between social media and the news, you know, corporation, right? So how are we going to deal with this issue of social media? I do think that the state has to do something because otherwise uh, this whole issue can get out of, I and mean, it's already clear, clearly getting out of control, right? I mean, forget about democracy in the next couple of years. This is how important these issues kind of like are at the core of, of so I do think that, you know, to answer your question, some sort of like regulation is needed, definitely. Okay. Uh, anyone else, any, any final closing words? Uh, no, I agree with uh, Francisco there that the, the, the government, the, the state's got a role to play to set up the, in, I guess the structures so that um, the citizens are getting a, a fair and unbiased view and it's not being manipulated by people, but. Any time a government or the state uh, comes in to, be, to play arbitrator or umpire, then the public generally is always sceptical because they know that it is always an avenue there for bias on the government's behalf. Perhaps if they came in with uh, a, a whole group of you know, people from um, the marketing, people from outside of the government, but people that you could see were good business people or whatnot, that you know, a body that the public would generally not be sceptical about in the first instance because they're always sceptical um, about not only a government. But if somebody is going to appoint themselves as a moral guardian, um, yeah. people will, will, will call the pub test. And if it doesn't pass a pub test, which is 
general opinion, then it doesn't it doesn't wash. So, like anybody is somebody uh, uh, a self appointed moral guardian is somebody they're not going to trust. <laughs> right. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the. I guess we uh, would need more time to fully suss this out, but it's plain. Uh, real time in the United States and in Australia. So it was nice to talk about it. And um, thank you for watching Heart, uh, Heart Fire Media Liberal Conversations, a series of programming we're doing under the national emergency during the COVID period. I would like to thank my guests for coming on the show and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Peace out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Essential, essential, essential.